Good afternoon and welcome to our Character in the Professions Conference. My name is Kenneth Townsend and I'm Director of Leadership and Character in the Professional Schools at Wake Forest and Scholar in Residence in the School of Law. For those who have already participated in previous sessions of our conference, welcome back. And for those joining for the first time, welcome. We have had over 2,300 people register for this conference from 37 different countries and six different continents. We are so grateful that you can be part of this group. And on behalf of the um, Oxford Character Project, I am pleased to welcome you to this session, Diversity, Character, and the Professions, featuring a keynote address by Dr. Stephanie Creary, followed by a panel with distinguished leaders and scholars from a variety of contexts who will be offering their perspectives on diversity and character in the professions. We hope that you will stay with us for the panel, which begins at the same link at 5.15 p.m. The panel will be moderated by Jose Vialba, v uh, VP for Diversity and Inclusion here at Wake Forest, and will feature Naran Khan of the Ford Foundation, Ibu Patel of the Interfaith Youth Corps, and Stephanie Pender Amaker of Harvard and the McLean Hospital. This afternoon, following Professor Curry's talk, we will have time for questions from the audience. The chat is disabled, so please ask your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. My colleagues and I will field these questions and then present them directly to Professor Creary. We will not have Q&A following the panel discussion, however, that follows Professor Creary's presentation. Also, I wanna note that with the support of Wake Forest program in interpreting and translation studies, we're offering live interpreting services in Chinese and Spanish for today's sessions. So if you would like to access interpreting services, look at the bottom of your screen and click on the link. Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Stephanie Creary. She is an assistant professor of management at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. She is also an affiliated faculty member of the Wharton People Analytics and a senior fellow of the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. Her research focuses on the identity and diversity work that allows leaders to improve the quality of relationships across differences in the workplace. Her talk today is entitled, Holding On to the Virtues in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Work in the Professions. I'm super excited about this. Welcome, Professor Creary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. It's my honor and pleasure to be here with you all. Happy Friday from Philadelphia. Uh, so by, by, I think, training and expertise, I'm a, I'm a diversity, equity, and inclusion scholar and an identity expert, and I'm so thrilled to have an opportunity to, to actually begin to bridge some of the work that I do on a daily basis, both in my own academic pursuits, but also in advising companies. I'm happy to be able to bridge that with this larger conversation around character. And, and so for me today, I've chosen to talk about this through the lens of the virtues. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started by uh, just telling you that as we begin to think about this topic today, I want you to not only center yourself as a human, I want, to center your, I want you to center yourself as a professional who has many things to grapple with in the context of everyday work life. And certainly increasingly so these days, we see that one of those things is understanding our role in a larger conversation related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what we can do to help facilitate not only our personal goals on this topic, but those of the communities uh, to which we belong, whether those are our workplace communities or our surrounding communities in our home environments. And so let me just begin by suggesting to you that uh, our professions, um, and our identities are both meaningful. So what we know from scholarship is that our professions can be an important source of meaningfulness for us, um, both in the context of our lives broadly, but also in the context of our workplace experiences. Uh, our professions and our professional identities guide our behavior in the workplace. So you can think of them as motivators of sorts. And we know that we as individuals evaluate our own sense of worth and competence uh, based on our professional identities. And that our identities and this sense of worth and competence can be an important source of well being, esteem, and pride. So, what do I mean when I'm talking about professional identity? 
Well, what I'm talking about is this idea that we develop a subjective, so a felt sense of ourselves um, in one or more professional roles. So many of us have multiple professional identities at one time. You can think about this as um, if you are a person who, for, for example, is an engineer, but you also have managerial responsibilities. Those might feel like two different professional roles combined into the same person. Um, and for many of us, we've shifted our professional identities over time. So maybe we, uh, we, we were in one profession. I used to work in healthcare uh, prior to starting my PhD. And then certainly once I became a professor, I decided that I could no longer uh, enact that professional identity that I had as a healthcare provider. But our understanding of ourselves in our professions, that's something that does develop over time. And we become to understand who we are vis-a-vis -vis our professions through a process that we talk about as a negotiation. So what do we mean by negotiation? Well, we're talking about the fact that we're recognizing that it's not just ourselves sitting in a space by ourselves deciding who we want to be when we grow up or who we want to be tomorrow. Uh, there is a larger social context. There are other people who have values, who have standards, who have a process that we call socialization that does necessitate some um, if you will, some standard set of values or principles that are aligned with what the profession demands of us. But that doesn't mean we're totally beholden to what others want us to do and who they want us to be. We can individualize uh, ourselves in a profession in many different ways, just like we can individualize ourselves as a member of any demographic group or any organization in ways that we choose. But I th would say the operative idea here is that we are talking about a negotiation between ourselves and the broader so social context and workplace context in which we're situated. When we begin to think about professional identity in the context of diversity, equity, and inclusion, here abbreviated DEI, I want to talk about this as the opportunities, but also some of the challenges in, as we relate these two concepts. So one of the opportunities that diversity, equity, inclusion conversations bring us is this understanding that many of us want to be known and understood for what makes us unique for us as individuals, for I wanna be known as being you know, Stephanie and, and I want you to know who Stephanie is as a person, but at the same time, we all want to belong in some way. Um, we don't necessarily all want to belong in the same way, but in some way we all have this, this desire to belong to something that is not just ourselves, that is some sort of um, entity, whether that's a team, whether that's an organization, whether that's a community more broadly. And so when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're simultaneously recognizing this need to be distinct uh, or unique and also this need to feel like we belong as well. And so what our research on this topic tells us in the field that I belong to organizational behavior is that when we're able to effectively balance people's needs for uniqueness and belongingness, um, that, uh, that outcome can result in powerful experiences such as strength and work engagement and commitment to our workplaces and our work organizations. But this isn't without challenges, right? Some of the challenges that we know is that there is a certain uh, expectation that we as individuals will quote unquote fit into our organizations and fit into our organization's values. Um, one of the challenges around this whole notion of cultural fit is that it can to some extent reduce our ability to individualize, to present ourselves as authentic individuals, personalized beings in the workplace. And that in some cases when really um, not as helpful as it could be, this notion of cultural fit can um, motivate us to cover or hide in some respects aspects of our valued authentic selves. And so what we know from research is that this propensity to cover in order to fit in with what's deemed culturally acceptable in our organizations can actually produce negative implications for what companies are trying to accomplish from a diversity, equity, inclusion perspective. And so as a result, companies miss many opportunities to, to grow and learn and capitalize on the benefits of DEI that they're really seeking to gain. So with that said, um, as we progress throughout our time together this afternoon, I want to talk to you more specifically about how do we hold on 
to our sense of ourselves, but our sense of ourselves as being virtuous in our professions. And, and what does that mean? And I will unpack what it means to be virtuous or to have a virtuous per professional identity and what the virtues are that allow us to not only be the professionals that we wanna be, but do the diversity, equity, inclusion work that is so important in order to be able to create more equitable, more just, and just more uh, functionally effective organizations and workplaces. And so without, it goes without saying that there are a certain number of benefits and challenges in doing diversity, equity, inclusion work. It is both an opportunity, but also a challenge to create cultures um, in which people can effectively incorporate different aspects of themselves. Um, and it's hard to do that in a way that is both individually meaningful and also meaningful to our organization. So both an opportunity and a challenge. Even though it's so important to, uh, in, in, to begin to develop and implement diversity and equity inclusion practices and policies, just having them, just having a bunch of policies and procedures and policies at our disposal is not enough to, able, to be able to create many of the outcomes. So they are a, uh, a foundational tool, but they don't just make um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion meaningful on their own. We do need to be able to create a process um, through which these things can actually be useful. And this whole idea of being able to foster and sustain any professional identity, let alone what I will submit to as a virtuous professional identity um, through and in relation to diversity, equity, inclusion work, that actually can be very challenging. But when it does happen, it can be a generative, a productive, a meaningful experience, not only for us as individuals, but for our workplaces more broadly. And so let's unpack this idea of a virtuous professional identity what am I talking about? Well, I've already talked to you about what a professional identity is. It's a sense of ourselves in a profession, that self-relevant meaning that we develop that's negotiated between our profession, our organization, and our own sense of who we want to be when we grow up. When we have that professional identity and when it's actually infused with things that are strengths, um, characteristics and qualities that we deem good or that are considered good for us, that's what a professional identity is, is when we hold on to the goodness, the characters, the strengths and the qualities that are associated with the virtues and character strengths. And so there are six core virtues uh, that are have been identified by the uh, amazingly talented Peterson and Seligman. And this is from their work in 2004. It's a wonderful resource. And what I'm going to do for you here today is to uh, apply their framework, their six core virtues, um, to the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion to invite us to think much more carefully around how we can continue to develop ourselves and our, our virtuous professional identities in and through DEI work. So uh, here are the six core virtues that Peterson and Seligman identified, courage, justice, humanity, temperance, transcendence, and wisdom. And we're going to walk through each of these and apply this to the context of DEI work throughout the rest of our time together. So let's start with courage. By definition, courage um, is referring to the emotional strengths, keyword emotional, emotional strengths that involve the exercise of will to accomplish goals in the face of opposition, and that opposition can be external or internal, okay? So to the extent that we want to become more courageous, uh, Peterson and Seligman suggests that there are four characteristics that we need to be developing in order to achieve this virtue of being courageous. They're listed here for you, bravery, persistence, integrity, and vitality. Bravery is this idea of not shrinking in, in the face of threat, resistance, or challenges. Persistence being this idea that we're going to continue moving in a forward direction in spite of any obstacles that we may be facing. Integrity is that we're persisting in a genuine and sincere way. And vitality is that we're approaching our tasks, our work, anything that we are asked to do with a, a, a great sense of excitement and energy. So these are the characteristics that we need to have according to Peterson and Seligman in order to become more courageous. So let's think about courage in the context of DEI. 
So let me talk to you about the common narratives. So these are the things that often we say or other people say that stand in the way of us becoming more courageous in DEI work. So perhaps you have heard yourself say this or heard someone else say any of the following three things. This is too hard. I'm just not really sure whether this will matter in the end. They just don't get it. I have so much other work to do besides this, okay? And so if we're trying to counter these common narratives, what we're really trying to do is, is, is allow the virtue of courage to manifest positively in DEI work, but that's not magic, right? It actually takes work, which is why I keep saying DEI work, but it also takes work to be more courageous. So, so what do we need to do? We need to learn to embrace uncertainty and ambiguity because the very notion of diversity, equity, inclusion, those words can feel ambiguous and the outcomes are often uncertain. Progress related to diversity, equity, and inclusion is very slow. And so being able to persist, even when you know it's gonna take a long time to gain meaningful progress in a DEI capacity, that becomes really important and particularly in the face of resistance. Speaking truth to power, this idea that many of us feel that we are not necessarily the person who is going to create large scale transformational change in our organizations, but being able to present a, a conversation to those in power that helps them to challenge their own beliefs on whether or not DEI is important takes courage. And certainly this idea of going all in, you know, putting not only your best face forward, but putting your best energy forward. That's what it takes to be able to develop courage to um, in the context of DEI work. So I could certainly talk at you for the next 30 minutes, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you all throughout our time together to participate in different polls. And so we're going to start with poll one here. And so you should be able to see that on your side. And I want you to consider the place in which you currently work. Um, I want you to answer this question around the idea that um, leaders and managers show that they value courage in DEI work. Would you say almost always? Would you say sometimes? Or would you say never? Right, we're doing great. Tells me that 60% of you have voted, excellent. That's greater than the participation in many of my academic research surveys. So I think we're doing a great job. All right, I'll give it another second or so. Slowing down, okay. Going once, going twice. I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll and I will share the results and hopefully you can see them on your side. I'm gonna go ahead and write a note down here for myself and you might wanna do that as well. So, uh, with respect to courage, 26% of you said always, um, with respect to leaders and managers always showing that they value courage in DEI work, 69% of you said sometimes, and 5% of you said never, okay? I'm gonna stop that for just a moment and I'm gonna keep us moving through the next virtue, which is justice. So what is justice? Justice has been defined by Peterson and Seligman as civic strengths that underlie healthy community life. And so if you're trying to become more just in your actions and in your being, um, several characteristics are needed in order to become more just. Citizenship, so being a good citizen, which means doing your share. Practicing um, fairness, not letting your biases get in the way of things you're trying to achieve and other people's success. And leadership, being able to organize or take responsibility for organizing tasks and events, but also taking responsibility for making sure that they're executed well. So what are the common narratives that can stand in the way of justice in the context of DEI work? Well, let me tell you um, what your voice might have said or someone in your vicinity's voice might have said. Well, they aren't doing it, so why should I? Isn't it biased to pay attention to people's differences? I'm tired of having to organize all of the DEI events. Okay, 
So if we're trying to become more just and allow justice to manifest more positively in DEI work, here's what we're trying to accomplish. We can one, adopt a pay it forward mindset, meaning that perhaps this is about allowing ourselves to create better organizations for the next generation of workers. We can acknowledge that differences um, we can acknowledge differences to understand where gaps in fairness exist. So understanding that it's important to look at our differences because that helps us to reveal gaps in equity when we begin to look between the categories. And even though our work might not be the work that creates the transformational change, there's this concept of small wins that is very important and seeing ourselves as perhaps the catalyst for getting the conversation started with respect to DEI. Um, and being able to speak up when others are silent. These are characteristics and these are things that we could build in order to create more just workplace and develop ourselves as more just in the context of our professional identities. All right, so now we have poll number two. So for poll number two, consider the place where you currently work. Um, answer, uh, best to the best of your ability, Leaders and managers show that they value principles of fairness in DEI work. We're much faster this time. All right, we'll give it about 10 more seconds. Okay, last takers. And I will end. And let's see what you said. Okay, so 29% of you said always. 64% of you said sometimes. So that's about the same as the previous. And a few more of you said never. Okay, moving along. Let's move to our third virtue, which is humanity. So humanity is defined by the interpersonal strengths that involve tending and befriending others, okay? And so if we're trying to develop more hum humanity and our sense of being people who value humanity, what we're really trying to do is to develop our, our capacity for love. So our, our ability to reciprocate caring and sharing in relation to other people. We're trying to develop our capacity for kindness. So our ability to, to value helping and taking care of others. And we're also trying to develop our social intelligence. So knowing ourselves certainly, but also knowing others and what makes them tick. And so what can stand in the way of this in the context of a diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, these are common narratives that often get in the way. This is just a job. No matter what you do, some people will just never care. And so if we're always trying to become more positive with respect to ourselves at work and certainly allow this virtue of humanity to manifest positively in DEI work, then it takes us all becoming more community motivated and speaking to people in their language. Now that can mean their native language uh, whether that's Spanish or Chinese or English or American Sign Language, that could be helping people to understand based on how they understand the world works, what we're trying to achieve. So we often see this um, in the context of diversity, equity, inclusion, people adopting like a business case for diversity, equity, inclusion to help people who are business or financially or profit motivated to understand why this is meaningful. And, and certainly that's controversial in and of itself, but that is just an example of how we begin to help people to see things through their lenses and not just our own, if we're really trying to be more humane in our DEI work. And so let's take the next poll. Okay, so consider the place where you currently work. Leaders and managers show that they value humanity in DEI work. Thank you for everybody who was participating. It's really great participation rate. So I do feel like we're getting a good sense of the group, the majority of the group. All right, about 10 more seconds. All right.
right, last takers. I see some people trickling in. This is the highest participation yet. All right, let me go ahead and show you the results. So in this group, 45% of you said always. That's incredible. That's so much greater than the others. We can reflect on that later, maybe in the Q&A. But 47% of you said sometimes. Um, and then 8% of you said never. So I like that that never um, percentage is, is, is staying small. That's great. That's great. Okay, so let's move along to our next virtue, which is temperance. This is defined as strengths that protect against excess. So if we're trying to achieve this virtue of temperance, we're practicing or we're learning how to become better at forgiveness and mercy, which means accepting others' shortcomings, even though that's difficult. Uh, humility and modesty, not seeking the spotlight, which is really hard when organizations value self-promotion and the whole nature of competition is based on ranking systems. Prudence, being careful about one's choices and self-regulation, this idea of being disciplined in what you're, what you're doing. And so what are the narratives that often stand in the way of achieving temperance? Perhaps you've heard people say something like, the last time I tried, they openly rejected this idea, i.e., I don't feel like trying again. We've made many, many top companies for diversity lists, so patting ourselves on the back. Sometimes you just need to say it like it is, no matter how it makes them feel. But really, if we're trying to achieve temperance in, in DEI work, we're really trying to give people a second chance, acknowledging that each of us enters a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion from a different place. Some of us have been learning about diversity, equity, inclusion since we were children. And some of us, it didn't become something that was talked about until we became uh, people uh, who were of some uh, sense of um, you know, success in organizations. We became advanced in our careers. And so allowing people the opportunity to come into this conversation over time is deeply important if we're really trying to observe or practice or promote temperance. So organizations are very good these days at, at applying for diversity, equity, inclusion awards. And the reasons why many of them do this is because that is a motivator. Extrinsic rewards are a motivator for many people. But what we know is that there's not necessarily a strong correlation between being rewarded for diversity, equity, inclusion, and actually creating more equitable and inclusive workplaces. So just because you've been awarded, it, oftentimes these awards are determined based on how much you're doing, not on how what you're doing is creating equity and inclusion. And so thinking more about seeking outcomes versus just seeking awards and notoriety becomes increasingly important in this space. And then this idea of that delivering negative feedback is always tricky, especially when it comes to helping someone to understand that they are not the most inclusive manager. So how do you deliver that feedback in a way that allows you to take the perspective of somebody who's always gonna believe that they are fair, who's always gonna be that they're inclusive and practicing empathy and perspective taking in that regard. So let's go to our poll for temperance. Really excited to see what your workplaces are like. Okay, so consider the place where you work. Leaders and managers show that they value temperance in DEI work. We're still doing great. About another 10 seconds or so. All right, going once, going twice, and closing. All right, so what did you say? 20% of you said always, 66% of you said sometimes, and 14% of you said never. So now that never creeped, I, I spoke too soon. I was so happy that with the first four, we stayed below 10% on the nevers. And then now when we talk about temperance, we're getting to this place of where more people are saying never. Although the sometimes is relatively operating in the same band across many of these same categories. Okay, let's move on to number five, transcendence. 
So this is the idea that's, that we're talking about strengths that forge connections to the larger universe, however you define the universe, and provide meaning. And so if we're trying to uh, achieve or practice or develop our sense of transcendence, um, there are several characteristics, at least five, that are needed in order to achieve this virtue. Appreciating beauty and excellence in all things, no matter how small or large. Taking time to express thanks for even seemingly small gestures. Believing that good can be brought in the future. Seeing the light side. Now, that doesn't mean ill humor jokes. It means being able to see the light side in a lot of what we are doing and believing in some sense of a higher purpose. That doesn't mean a religious purpose, though it can. In some case, it means believing in something just larger than yourself and some purpose just larger than your own needs. And so what are the types of things that people often say that can help us to understand they're struggling with this sense of transcendence? When they're talking about diversity inclusion, equity inclusion, they might say things like, well, this isn't rocket science. They are getting paid, i.e., so that's why they should do it. We've been here before and nothing's changed. So we've been doing this diversity, equity, inclusion work a long time, doesn't matter, nothing ever changes. And so if we're trying to enable this value or this virtue to manifest positively in our DEI work, we're trying to recognize that it really does take a lot of skill, experience, and expertise to create meaningful change with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion we do need to make sure we're thanking everyone for their contributions, not just the people who have opted out for a long time and are now opting in, but there are people who have been doing diversity, equity, inclusion work long before it was, dare I say it, cool, right? Or a sign of the times. And those individuals deserve all of our thanks for persisting and keeping everything going, even when they didn't have a lot of support on their side. And then I think as we're trying to talk about transcendence when it comes to DEI work, we're really trying to appreciate the journey. Um, so the fact that perhaps we started 20 years ago and now we're all having a great conversation about this, even though the conversation comes with bumps and bruises, that's something to be grateful for. And it's certainly something that allows us to begin to understand the larger meaning, the larger purpose of what we're trying to accomplish. So the journey, not necessarily the destination. All right, poll number five. Leaders and managers show that they value transcendence in DEI work. You guys are staying with me. Thank you so much. All right, about another 10 seconds. Going once, going twice. All right. Okay, so 28% of you said always, 58% of you said sometimes, and we're back at that 14% for never. Thank you. All right, sorry about that. Let me move us to the last virtue, which is wisdom. So when we talk about wisdom, we're talking about the cognitive strengths that entail the acquisition and use of knowledge. And so if we're trying to become more wise, we're thinking about our capacity to develop our, 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 our results, our, our abilities around creativity. And so when we're talking about creativity, we're talking about our capacity to think in novel and productive ways. How are we developing a sense of curiosity, our, our, our zest for exploration and discovery? Are we becoming more open-minded and what are we doing to cultivate that characteristic to be able to examine things from all sides, not just our own? What about our love for learning? How are we nourishing that? How are we gaining new skills and knowledge? And what about our perspective? How are we learning to look at the world in many different ways? Um, in, definitely in ways that make sense to us, but also being able to understand how they might make sense to other people, which might not necessarily be the same ways in which the world looks to ourselves. And so when people are struggling with this virtue, 
Um, what we see is, is paralysis, as I like to explain it colloquially, but um, perhaps these narratives ring a bell. Well, XYZ company does it like this, so that's just how we should do it. It's easier if we just do it the way we've always done it. And so if we're trying to become more wise as workers and as organizations with respect to diversity, equity, inclusion, we're trying to not just copy something or do it the way that we've always done it. If uh, there's the capacity for us to learn more, if we experiment and if we're curious and if we take different perspectives. So that means collecting different types of data. Um, obviously, as a, a scholar, I really love data. I love qualitative data and quantitative data. And I believe you learn different things about diversity, equity, inclusion by looking at both types of data. We often understand the experiences of people who are underrepresented or in the numerical minority by looking at qualitative data, because oftentimes, because they're in the numerical minority, quantitative data can't effectively capture um, who they are and what they're experiencing. So being able to look at many types of data can help us be more wise with respect to diversity, equity, inclusion. Experimentation, again, as somebody who's an organizational scholar and social scientist, this is what we do. We try things out, but I would say a lot of us, because of that fear of ambiguity or uncertainty in general, but also on this topic, it becomes hard to feel comfortable ex experimenting. But the reason why so many organizations have so many great DEI initiatives is because they did experiment. They, they stretched themselves into the unknown. They took a great, great leap of faith into the unknown, not knowing if it was going to work. And certainly sometimes it works, sometimes it's not the outcome that you desire, but being able to modify what you're doing based on feedback is critical as we're trying to become more wise in our DEI work. And so for our last poll, let me take us to number six. Okay, so let's talk about your workplace. Leaders and managers show that they value wisdom in DEI work. about 10 more seconds. And let's see what you said. Okay, so this is the highest percent of always. 36% of you said always. 55% of you said sometimes. And we're back under 10%, 9% of you said never. Thank you all so much. It's great data to have. I think it's always a great experience. I know Zoom land is, 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 has been a place where many of us have lived for the last year. I always think it's great in the context of conferences, but also I also teach for a living, college students and MBA students. It's nice to be able to see how the other people um, feel in your environment. I actually feel like this has been introducing polls into all of my um, talks, whether that's working in the classroom or um, at conferences or working with companies. Um, that is a very nice way of practicing inclusion and creating a sense of community and belonging um, when we're feeling uh, inherently disconnected from other people given the, the virtual uh, format. So thank you all for letting us know how you're feeling. So I want to end um, before we open it up to question and answers, just with a call to action. I've spent the last 15 years of my work life um, trying to understand and create interventions. And I think overall motivate people to feel positive about the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as you can imagine, that has not been an easy thing to do. Um, it has definitely been, I spent much of that time facing a great deal of resistance from people who thought I should be spending my time doing something else or studying something else. Um, I would say there's been an extraordinary amount of doubt. And every time that there's major social unrest, um, like there has been for the last 
five years, um, but I think more uh, recently with respect to racial injustice, and that's beginning to magnify um, in ways that I have not seen in my lifetime. I will say that it's not always easy for me to maintain this sense of virtuousness in my own professional identity as a professor, as a scholar, but I have to tell you that I am so inspired by all of the work that various individuals and institutions and organizations have done over this past year and have committed to doing as we're trying to create, in this case, a more racially equitable and just world. I am disheartened by the continued violence against black and brown people and all of the violence against Asian and Asian American, the Pacific Islander community. And I am hopeful though, that if more of us are to be able to engage virtuously in our professional identities in the context of DEI work, that many more of us will feel safe, will feel included, will feel like we belong, and will feel like we too can be successful not just as professionals, but as people who really do want to live a life well lived. And so I'll just leave you with these closing thoughts is I want you to seek opportunities to engage virtuously, but also emotionally in DEI work. There's a range of emotions that we all experience, even those of us who have been doing this for a long time as we engage in this work but engaging virtuously and also feeling this wide range of experiences, it is necessary and it is important for enabling all of these actions and experiences that we've had recently to outlast the current moment that we're all sitting in now. So I thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Curry, for that uh, informative and inspiring talk. We're really grateful to have you with us. Uh, we do have time for about 15 minutes of Q&A, and I see that some questions have started to come in. If you would like to ask a question to Professor Curry, there's a Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. P please feel free to type a message in, and we'll try to get to as many questions um, as we can in the time that we have. Um, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and, and just jump in with our first question. And this question comes from Richard Wilkinson, um, who asks, what are the settings, the questions, and the desired outcomes of the DEI conversation in the workplace? And what are the practical measures of progress in workplace DEI efforts? Yes, yeah, so this is a big question. This is one that I've been working on for the last three years. And fortunately, <laughs> We're finally reaching a place of where in May of this year, through my work with Wharton People Analytics, but also an MBA team that has included more than 10 graduate students uh, who are in our Master's in Business Administration program at Wharton, as well as a doctoral student and my colleague, faculty colleague, we are actually answering this question. Um, it, it will live in an academic journal one day, but we've decided to preemptively share practical insights, which are very much in the spirit of answering Richard's question, because this is like the question of the day is what should we be doing and what are we trying to accomplish? And what our project is focusing on is, is does any of this stuff work? Um, so I wanted to give you just a little bit of a backstory here. And it's when we set out to do this work three years ago, it was because I was actually tired of people asking me, does diversity, equity, and inclusion work? And I, at that point, had been doing this for 12 years. And I think intuitively, uh, experts on this topic felt that this stuff was important because why else would they be spending all this time and energy putting mentoring programs into place, unconscious bias training, you name it, all the things that are done, right? And so um, what was very clear to me based on the start, the initial research, which started off as um, interviews with experts, was that while um, we were able to unearth about 100 different things that companies across industries were doing um, to manage diversity, equity, inclusion, there wasn't a lot of measurement being done to assess whether those activities were actually contributing to outcomes. If there were any outcomes that were being measured consistently, that was work engagement. But what I learned is that in many of these organizations, there's a broader workplace engagement survey, and it, but it looks at a lot of things and measures a lot of things in terms of how it affects your engagement, so your connection to work. Um, and oftentimes, each group in an organization is 
in a sense, fighting, negotiating, that's a better word, negotiating for space in this survey. So it means that the diversity, equity, inclusion group only has the capacity to ask three questions about diversity. And, and then when the data are being analyzed to see whether those three things, which are very broad and generic, um, happen to drive your engagement. And so because we were doing an academic project and you know it becomes a little bit easier to ask people 20 minutes worth of survey questions, we expanded our list to a broad um, array of outcomes. I can't name them all for you here because there are about 13 of them and my memory is good, but not that great. Engagement is one of them, but we also look at various forms of speaking up behavior, speaking out against bias, speaking up to uh, suggest ideas that are supposed to help the organization move forward, and speaking up broadly in, in with respect to uh, supporting diversity strategy. There are also things like job satisfaction and turnover intent that can be measured as well, um, helping behavior, um, belonging, uh, the extent to which you perceive the climate is inclusive. So I think I've named a lot of them. But um, what our research is doing is looking at the variety of practices that companies can put in place. And we're trying to assess the relationship to those outcomes, in a sense, answering the question of which practices drive belonging, which practices drop, drive job satisfaction, which practices will help reduce turnover intent. So uh, Richard, I hope that answers your question, but I would say look out May 2021 through War and People Analytics, we'll release this report and you'll be able to read more about this in detail. Wonderful, that's exciting. That's really great to hear, <laughs> Stephanie. Um, so uh, before I read the next question, I just wanna read a comment that I think is really delightful. This is from Josie and she says, thank you so much for this. I'm a 50 year old woman and not an academic. You have given me a framework to articulate my ideas and feelings about this capital letters, very important issue. I believe I'm better prepared to be courageous, authentic and wise. So just wanted to pass that along. Uh, now uh, to our next uh, question, and this is from uh, Erin Miller. And, and she asked, when you look at the polling data that you just collected from this audience, does it align with the virtues that are generally emphasized or not emphasized in workplaces? What does it tell you about our strengths and the places that we need to grow? So this is a wonderful question, Erin. And I will have to tell you that this was an experiment for me um, in doing this presentation for you today is understanding how to link these things. I think this is an opportunity for a study that helps people to begin to understand DEI in terms of the virtues. I have not seen, which is why I think I wanted to construct this presentation. I'm also writing this presentation up, up in, in the book that will be on this topic. I think this is a great opportunity to ask those questions. But if I think broadly about virtues being practiced or not in the context of my data, um, you know, I would say that, you know, we talk about courage a lot um, with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I would say, as I've been reading CEO statements in the last year of, of what it will take to begin to act upon notions of equity in ways that we haven't done before, I've seen a lot of mentions of courage, right? So to me, it feels like that word is being, is being used much more frequently than perhaps I would have seen outside of the DEI expert context. So DEI experts often when they're talking about trying to engage people, they're trying to say, you need to be courageous. But to hear all the CEOs talk about, we need to be courageous as a community, that to me feels a bit new. Um, fairness certainly is a topic that permeates diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is very hard to understand what is fair because what is fair to one person doesn't feel fair to another, but it continues to be a dilemma and an opportunity. I think this notion of um, you know, temperance, this idea of being able to understand it's important to be um, lauded you know, for what you're doing, um, that's important, but, but it has to be about more than that um, or else organizations become complacent. So I guess what it is, is I actually see elements of these in the work, but we don't have a clear understanding yet of how these, the extent to which or the frequency by which these virtues are actually showing up in relation to uh, DEI in the workplace. I think at this point, 
the anecdotes that I offer you are, are sort of the best examples of, of how this works. Thank you for your question. Great, thank you for that answer, um, Professor Curry. Um, our next question is from R. Wiggs, um, who asks, what practices seem to have an impact on retention? Um, we are recruiting, and I assume R. Wiggs is talking about maybe as an employer, uh, well, we are recruiting well and responding to clients, but how can we do a better job retaining fantastically talented people? Yeah, so it depends on, you know, which people are you trying to retain, right? So. Um, to some extent, um, as we begin to have a conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion, what we have to acknowledge is that um, standard practices for retention in terms of offering people greater salary, right, um, and a promotion doesn't always retain women and people of color, right, to the same extent that it might retain someone who doesn't um, identify with one of those groups. And that is because we know that being in a workplace in which you feel like you include, you're included and you belong has a much stronger effect on people's workplace experiences if you're in the numerical minority. So let me say that differently. For women and people of color and for people who come from marginalized you know, social categories who are LGBTQ, there's a stronger relationship between feeling like you belong and feeling like you're included and your intent to stay. So it's not that if you're a man or if you're white that these don't matter, it just means that it's not as important as some of these other things. So I would say the reason why you probably see so much language around belonging and inclusive culture is we know that that is really important to increasing the retention rates of those who tend, whose, whose intent to turn is higher. And most organizations, it's um, when they're actually cutting the data by gender and race minimally, they're finding that for women and people of color, the intent to turn is often higher than for other groups. Thank you for your question. Great, and thank you for that response. Um, the next question gets at the, uh, the issue or um, question of, of exemplars, role models in a way. Do you have stories of managers who are exemplars of these virtues or organizations that have effectively encouraged and cultivated these virtues? Oh gosh, you know, it's so hard as I, I always worry about moral licensing, right? So I always worry about telling people that this is good or these folks are good because then it makes you think that you only have to aspire to be that and not do more. So as opposed to naming people and organizations, let me talk to you about some signs um, that you might wanna look for as you're trying to figure out like this is a manager who is doing a great job and side note, probably should continue to do more of that and some other stuff to be even better. And here are signs that of organizations that are doing a good job, but everybody can do more, right? So managers who are doing a great job are taking the time to not only check in um, with people who are new to the team or the organization, they're also taking the time to check in with people who are underrepresented in some capacity because they have the social intelligence to know that it can be a much lonelier experience when you are new and when you are outnumbered on a team. These same managers who are doing a good job are also openly talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They are not shying away from the conversation no matter how awkward or uncomfortable it is. They are reaching out to their black colleagues or their Asian colleagues, the people who are part of their team and saying, I just wanted to let you know I'm thinking about you as I'm listening to uh, the events that are happening. I can imagine that this might be difficult for you. I just wanna let you know that I'm here to talk if you need someone to talk to. They're doing a good job. With respect to organizations that are doing a good job, they're not just measuring their success by how many things they're doing, right? They're actually beginning to look at outcomes. They're trying to understand is what we're doing actually worth it? Whether that is, are we seeing our engagement scores improve in relation to our diversity, equity, inclusion work? Are we seeing our teams become more inclusive? So these are really important. But at the end of the day, 
these organizations that are doing a good job aren't waiting for investors to pressure them to begin to be transparent about their outcomes or what the composition of their workforce is. They're doing it on their own. Um, so that's become a thing recently. It's been necessary to invite some of the companies on the sidelines who have been sitting out of the diversity conversations. They've needed investors to pressure them to say, we're gonna vote against you if you don't uh, begin to help us understand what you're doing because we think that there's a risk to our investment if you, we don't know what's going on with respect to diversity and inclusion. So that's been a new conversation. But there are companies that were being transparent about what they were doing and what they where they still needed to go before there was this pressure. So I hope that gives you a good understanding of, of, of what you can look for if you're trying to assess for yourself whether these managers are doing a good job or whether these organizations are doing a good job as well. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so I know we're almost out of time. So I think that this might be our last question, uh, but it builds, I think, pretty well on the, the question that you've just answered. And this is from, and forgive me if I mispronounce this, uh, Cleo Akravu, um, who asks, there are organizations which have found ways to succeed um, even though they've lacked virtuous management or virtuous uh, managers um, who are leading the organization, how can we help teach our students to also be prepared to do something if they find themselves in such organizations? So it's basically a question about how to empower those who might not be in leadership roles, yeah. but who find themselves in organizations where the work needs to be done, um, but the leaders aren't doing it. Yeah, so I think part of this, uh, the answer to the question is challenging the notion of what success means. And so if by success, you mean that the company is making a lot of money, you can look to financial organizations like private equity and hedge funds, they're, they're making a killing when it comes to financial returns. But those aren't the only metrics of success. And this is where I feel like the investor conversation where they are pressuring these individuals to do more is actually helpful. As they're saying that's not the only metric of success because we feel like there are risks in your organization because you're not paying attention, for example, to diversity, equity, inclusion. And so while it looks like you're making success, that success can potentially be threatened because you're not being equ equitable and inclusive, all right? So there's that side of the conversation. But that's you know, not a conversation necessarily for an individual contributor who doesn't feel like they have a strong voice. But there's so much that can be done if you're an individual contributor. Um, so much of what has happened in organizations with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion, if we're talking about employee resource groups, or if we're talking about um, happy hour Fridays where people have um, conversations with team members, this is not coming top down. This is actually coming bottom up. So, so much of the DEI work you're seeing is the outcome of bottom up individual contributor processes, starting the conversations, engaging more and more people, and then people at the top saying, ah, oh, this actually seems like a good thing. I think we're on to something. So even though it looks very top down because that's what makes the news, I want to challenge you to really understand that so much of what you're seeing is coming from the ground up. And so that means that you too can start something, start an initiative in your organization and help drive it forward as well. Wonderful. And what a, an appropriate way, I think, to wrap up this part of our time together with giving us a sense of empowerment um, and a reminder of the, the work that we all have to do in this area. Thank you so much, Dr. Curry, for your time, uh, for this talk, uh, for what you've inspired us to carry with us as we move forward. Um, as we mentioned earlier at the outset, we're now going to take a short break. We're going to take a 15-minute break. We'll reconvene uh, at 5.15 p.m. Eastern Time for the panel discussion on diversity, character, and the professions, where we might touch on some of what we just heard from Dr. Curry, but also expand the conversation more broadly. Um, we very much hope that you can join this conversation. You don't have to go anywhere. The same link will remain active and carry you on into the panel discussion. If you do need to go away, go back to your email, um, find the link that you used to enter this conversation, and it'll be the same one for the panel to follow. Thank you again, Professor Curry, for your time. And I hope to see all of you um, and maybe even more in just a few minutes. See you at 515 Eastern time. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Hello and welcome or welcome back, whatever the case might be. 
Um, we're so pleased to have all of you here. Uh, thanks again to Professor Stephanie Creary uh, for the engaging presentation that many of us uh, just heard. Uh, so I'm now pleased to introduce Jose Viabla, who will be moderating our panel discussion focused on diversity, character, and the professions. Jose is the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion and the Chief Diversity Officer, as well as a Professor of Counseling here at Wake Forest. He has authored or co-authored over 50 manuscripts, book chapters, and editorials about health disparities in Latina and Latino youth, Latina and Latino access to and completion of higher education options, and issues related to college access for students from underrepresented groups. Since becoming an administrator, he has facilitated diversity and inclusion efforts for students, staff, and faculty in an effort to address issues of access and equity across campus. And I cannot imagine anyone better suited to host and moderate this conversation than Jose. It's all yours. Thanks a lot, Kenneth. No pressure, right? Especially on a Friday evening after five o'clock. Good evening and thank you so much for being part of this conference and part of this mutual exchange of information and ideas. As Kenneth said, my name is Jose Villalba. Uh, I use he, him pronouns and I'm the VP for DNI. Uh, more importantly, I love this topic. Uh, I appreciate the fact that um, we have had a chance to learn and, and, and grow over the last hour. And more importantly, that we've had a chance to grow as, as individuals over the past uh, couple of days. Um, it, it is truly a pleasure to have a panel of experts and a panel of devoted individuals to these topics, not just because it's timely, although it is, and not just because it's important, although it is, but also because it moves our society forward. Uh, it, it, they are the manifestations of character uh, and virtues in a way that I'm not sure that other things are. So I am, I'm humbled to be here and I'm grateful to be here. In a second, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie so that she can reintroduce herself and then our, our panelists will go ahead and introduce themselves in the order that they are listed. Uh, because this is Zoom world, it's very hard to um, wait for someone to get some sort of visual cue that it's their turn to go. And so we will keep that order um, as I ask questions of the panelists. And we hope that this provides for as clear a point of engagement as possible. And um, I believe Kenneth mentioned it before, but uh, this part of, of, of the uh, session today won't be open for questions. Um, it really is my chance to engage with these three professionals and these three uh, experts in this area. And so um, if you do have some sort of question or feedback, uh, Kenneth may or may, uh, may be able to drop something in the chat that can get th that information to you or maybe like, down the road, but it really is gonna be a dialogue between four individuals. So without further ado, Stephanie, I'm going to pass it over to you so that you can reintroduce yourself and then we'll keep going then that way. Ooh. So Stephanie, you are muted. And so. Okay. Perfect. Good to see you. <laughs> I'm here now. And <laughs> when you said the opportunity to Stephanie to reintroduce herself, I was just waiting for Dr. Creary to come back on and just join the panel. That's but actually, you're it's actually a joke. I I've had several colleagues today say, is that the Stephanie Pender Emmer? And so if your your reputation precedes you, which is I said reintroduce yourself. <laughs> I've, I've had I've had a lot of a lot of uh, fan person reaching out going I can't wait for her to talk so uh, that's oh. what I'm all about <laughs> <laughs> and to figure out how to turn on and off the mute button but I don't know who your colleagues are but thank you I'm I'm so um, delighted and honored to be here and to be this on uh, this panel um, I can't imagine and there are a few opportunities that I would uh, take to spend a Friday evening giving a talk or Friday except for this. And then what, what an honor to follow that incredible keynote by Dr. Creary. Really appreciated and resonated with so much of what she had to say. My name is Stephanie Pinder Amaker and uh, I am um, McLean Hospital's Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer I am also McLean's um, founding director of uh, their college mental health program. 
and an assistant professor of psychology at Harvard Med School. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Jose, do I just go next? Yes, you go next. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Okay, I was <laughs> fantastic. Hi, everyone. My name is Naran Han. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm director in the office of the president at the Ford Foundation. I'm also vice chair of the board of the Girl Scouts of the USA. And uh, I'm very excited to be here. We, I think we all need more conversations about character in our lives. And so um, I've been an eager uh, observer and listener to the rest of this and learner along the way. I'm so happy to contribute to this conversation. Um, because I get to introduce myself, I'm also just gonna embrace a little more of um, a DEI best practice. So I'm gonna describe myself uh, for those that are blind or visually uh, impaired. I am a mid-30s Pakistani-American woman with long brown hair, and I have um, kind of a hold up in a cabin. So that's my background. I'm thrilled to be here and very eager for this conversation. And I'm, I'll now uh, kick it to Ibu. Hello, everyone. My name is Ibu Patel. I'm founder and president of an organization called IFYC, uh, Interfaith Youth Corps. We work with uh, people from a range of different religious backgrounds to uh, engage in interfaith cooperation, to solve social problems, and to, uh, to strengthen America. Uh, I am 5'11", uh, Indian American Muslim Ismaili male, uh, in small hoop earring in each ear, rapidly graying hair because a very active and lovely uh, 13 and almost 11 year old boys. Thank you, Ibu. Thank you, Noor. And thank you, Stephanie. And Stephanie, I think, uh, we we uh, have a really interesting challenge. So I'm going to uh, reintroduce myself and give some physical characteristics as well. And then Stephanie, yeah. you can do that too. So Thank you. Uh, my, my name's Jose. Like I said before, I'm 5'9 on a good day. Uh, I am a Latino background. So I am a, a brown skin complexion. My mom is Cuban. My dad's Colombian. It's important to my identity. And I, uh, I'm holed up not in a cabin, but in uh, a guest room, which you can't see because there's a virtual backdrop of the Wake Forest University Wake Chapel at sunset. So um, I'm not on the quad, I'm in my office, but you can't see it. Thank you. Stephanie, what about you? Thank you all for modeling DEI best practice um, and inclusivity. Uh, again, my name is Stephanie. I am, I identify as a black African-American cisgender female. I'm about five, five. I think I'm still five, five, maybe shrinking a little bit to five, four and a half. I am uh, brown skin and I am sitting where I have been um, working and running my hospital program from home uh, for a year now, almost a year to the date uh, in a living room, in a soothing, calm, quiet setting. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Nora, and thank you, Ibu. So um, Stephanie Creary, Professor Creary, uh, really gave us a lot to chew on and a lot to think about um, from the research that she shared toward the end of her talk to how she started, really, um, talking about the framework that she shared with us and even going further back to how this work manifests and how uh, rewarding it can be. And it is pretty rewarding and also how challenging it can be. So I'd like to actually start there. There was a point in her discussion, early on in her discussion, where she mentioned this notion of cultural fit and how sometimes we may feel a certain pressure or challenge or um, thoughts around fitting into an organization and, and how that rubs up against our virtues, right? The virtues we were raised with, the virtues that we got in higher education, or as my father would say, indigenous education. And so thinking about the virtues that you've brought up along the way and how that sometimes tenses up or, or impacts the cultural fit of the professional world, how might you describe your own challenges and maybe successes in navigating those tensions between your virtues and maybe wanting to fit in or feeling a need to fit in in your professional setting? Stephanie, I believe you're up first. 
Sure, that's such a it's such a good question, and um, you know we talked and and actually Dr. Um, Cleary spoke earlier about um, sort of professional identity, and um, we think a lot about how you know virtues within professional identity help to keep folks whole. Um, when they come in, to, in and out of various occupations and workspaces. I think about it a little bit in reverse. Um, for me, I think about the importance of, and, and part of that's a psychologist and the nature of the work that, that I do, uh, which is that um, we spend a lot of time these days working with young people to help them think about various aspects of their social cultural identity. So um, as um, some high school uh, students recently rephrased for us, like your personal identity or the things you get to choose, like your favorite co color or your favorite book, but your social identity are the things that you inherit, like your race, ethnicity, um, gender expression, national origin, sexual orientation, and so forth. And so um, I think for me, um, I think about the evolution. First of all, I can't imagine a time when I didn't want to be a psychologist. I've known since I was 14 years old that this was my chosen profession. So it's really difficult for me to unpack some of these things. They're so intertwined because developmentally, I was literally still developing my personality while I had already made up in my mind, like this is professionally who I'm going to be. Um, but I, I would just say that um, at, at, the, at the core, um, for me, it's been and continues to be most important to think about the aspects of my identity um, that are most salient and are most meaningful for me. Um, for me, they happen to be, you know, I mentioned at the introduction, I identify as Black, um, cisgender, African-American woman. Um, my race, my ethnicity, and my gender are three aspects of my identity in which, um, through which I experience historically um, categorized as historically marginalized, at least in the United States. But there are also aspects of my identity through which I derive tremendous strength uh, and courage. And so knowing what we know now about how important it is to make sure that there is um, a real, people have a real solid sense of the social cultural identities that are meaningful to them, that that in fact correlates very closely with mental health and well-being. We're in a position now to go back and help younger kids work on this, right? So we didn't have to figure it out you know, by accident as many did so who came along in my direction, but now we get to work with younger kids and help them to think about themselves in terms of social cultural identity, what's meaningful, what matters, and to specifically be able to name and claim the strengths that they derive from those most meaningful aspects of their social cultural identity. And so I feel like when that foundation is in place, when that foundation, I'll speak for myself personally, with that intact, I have the ability the, to strive to be virtuous in my profession, to enter any professional challenge um, or ac space. Academic medicine is the space in which I you know, live uh, and, um, and navigate in spite of potential barriers, obstacles, and biases. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, it made me think a little bit about when you were talking about leaning into your, your own uh, cultural identity and, and your social identity. Um, not only it's important for you and that's how you show up, but also modeling it for young folks. Since you talked about teenagers and high schoolers and I kept thinking to myself, Jose, this is not uh, a, a workshop between you and Stephanie as counselor and psychologist talking about the next generation. This is a workshop where Noren and Ibu also get to talk. So I'll be quiet now and turn it over to Noren. <laughs> and let her share <laughs> the answer to her question. Jose, I'm hoping you'll restate the question. Sure, it is um, going back to that time when you feel like you've brought in your virtues and your, and your whole self into the workplace and realizing that, that there may be some tension or some expectation that your cultural fit needs to fit with that, with that workplace. Sure, sure. I mean, 
I think we all move about in the world thinking about context. We are who we are, whether it's our social life, our professional life, you're kind of always resituating yourself in your context. And there's always going to be tensions, opportunities, things to navigate. And I've had the privilege of having a couple of different professions, I would say. I'm trained as a lawyer. I actually worked in private corporate law for a couple of years. Very different vibe than in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and, and now I'm in, you know, private philanthropy. And I would just say, you know, I wouldn't make any assumptions about one culture, uh, for example, a culture of a nonprofit being more virtuous or open or, um, uh, uh, you know, perfect for someone to fully embrace who they are. I, I think there is so much that is intentional about the spaces you're in. And it's about leadership. It's about whatever core values are manifested. It's about your peers. And so I think a lot of folks, um, a lot of folks might just be like, oh, well, like that's, you know, that's the private sector. This is the public sector. You know, this is, this is how you can, you know, most fully profess yourself. And, and it, and it might seem like it would be uh, in a space that's, you know, professes certain values. And that's, that was certainly not the case. I think you can be very, very intentional about culture where you are. And just to be more specific and on point, um, I, just I'm just going to speak with a really concrete example like I, I don't drink alcohol I'm a practicing Muslim it's very important to who I who I am um, I also observe Ramzan by fasting I actually found at my law firm that was like a more easier thing to explain and observe because um, I actually had a lot of colleagues that were um, Orthodox Jews who were you know had really um, you know specific practices and when I like explained what my situation was it was so much easier for kind of everyone to understand what my parameters were, much more so sometimes than even operating in, in other spaces where you'd think that people would get stuff. So I guess what I'm just saying is we can control a lot of our culture. Um, we ourselves as, as leaders, as, as staff, as, you know, just like people in a workplace. And I would just encourage people to think about the ownership and intentionality that they have access to wherever they are in a hierarchy or in a kind of sphere of, of public space. Thank you for that response. I appreciate not only where you started, not assuming that just because you work at a nonprofit or just because you work at a school or higher ed, that it's some sort of kumbaya place where everybody understands and values diversity and inclusion, which we know is not always true but towards the end, how you reminded us that you can bring that authenticity and that culture and, and be authentic. And in a lot of ways, expect for others to reciprocate that, right? And, and um, I think for, for, for me, it's, it's uh, liberating and I appreciate that. I also wanna make sure that I am pronouncing your first name correctly. So great. It's, it's Naran. It's spelled Naran. It's never going to be like very straightforward, but thank you for even asking. That's great. <laughs> You're welcome. My parents gifted me with an interesting last name. So Naran, <laughs> I appreciate you helping me with that. All right, Ibu, I'm going to repeat the question for your benefit. That's that time, that tension, when you, you, you get to a, a place, a profession, and, and you want to bring that authentic self and you're wondering, what do I do to fit in? What do I not do to fit in? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Thank you for having me on this panel. Such a, such a blast. So I'll, I'll give a, a couple concrete examples. So um, I started getting interested in religious diversity when I was 19, 20 years old in college. I was kind of struck that there, that for all the attention paid to, to different dimensions of diversity in the early to mid 1990s when I was an undergrad and, and it, it, it was an inflection point in, in identity discourses feels a lot like now, actually, you know, you couldn't walk 10 feet, 10 feet, even at the University of Illinois, uh, which is not the most vanguard campus uh, on these issues. You couldn't walk 10 feet without running into somebody reading Bell Hooks or Cornell West, right? And of course, those are classics now and people are reading Ibrahim X. Kendi and Etan Essie Coates, but it was, it was a similar moment. Uh, a couple years into college, it kind of occurred to me uh, how important religious identity and diversity was in the world, the role that it played in, in, in ugly movements for extremism and also really positive movements for social justice and for, for civic 
uh, uh, strengthening, I became more interested in interfaith work. And I started going to interfaith conferences when I was 20 or 21, and they just bored the bejeebers out of me, right? They were just, they were just people on panels talking. And I say that ironically, tongue in cheek, because that is all that I do now. I am a dude on a panel talking all the time, like seven times a week. And that's not exaggerating, right? But back when I was 20 or 21, I was like, this is boring the bejeebers out of me. And, and I, I want to do interfaith work, but I don't, I don't want to do it this way. And so I'm going to start my own thing. And, and it wasn't like that kind of snap easy, but like at some, you know, uh, uh, um, my idea was I wanted to have a different, I wanted to, to, to engage religious diversity, but I wanted to do it with a different focus, young people and social action, not so much theologians and pontificating. And I wanted it to feel different. I wanted it to feel edgy. I wanted it to feel exciting. I wanted it to feel urgent. I wanted it to, you know, to feel like I would imagine SNCC felt, you know, in 1963 or the Catholic worker felt in 19, you know, 1938, you know, so I built, I built my own thing. And actually our first grant came from Ford, uh, $35,000 from a young Muslim woman uh, um, in 2002. And I'm super grateful for that. And I realize now that part of what I did and a lot of it is privilege and some of it is just like straight up, like, you know, uh, smoke and mirrors confidence uh, um, uh, uh, is I didn't like that other culture and so I built something that is more consistent with the culture that I do like. And I'm sure that there's a set of people that come to IFYC who don't, it doesn't, it doesn't jive with them, you know, and we're like a super fast paced place. You, you know, if you're up at seven, you probably have, and you're, and you're on the senior team, you probably have seven emails from me already. And that's not an overstatement, you know, like I'm up at, 5 a.m. And I'm just like Mach 5 all the time. And there are people that 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 doesn't connect with. And I think a very interesting question is, if an entire profession does not connect with an entire identity group, let's say women, right? My wife is uh, um, uh, uh, an Indian Muslim woman in the law, not unlike Naran, right? Narain. Uh, um, uh, uh, the legal profession at senior partner levels is not especially friendly to women, right? Um, that's a problem. If a particular organization uh, is very fast paced in part because of the personality of the founder and it's a 40 person shop, is that okay? You know, so I think, I think, I think it's interesting to ask questions like, like Wake Forest has a culture. And I've been at enough college campuses to know that Wake Forest has a culture that's different than, than Wash U, than Harvard, than the University of Miami. I, I think an interesting question is, is part, of, is part of the strength of a diverse civil society that different institutions have distinct cultures? And as long as those cultures are, are reasonably welcoming to a diverse, to diverse identity groups. So if Wake Forest was only for Southerners, right? Or, or, or only for Indian American immigrants, that's not good. But if Wake Forest can articulate its distinctive character and say to a prospective student, hey, listen, if you don't, you know, if you, if you don't want to reflect on character, that's okay. But Wake Forest is a place where we do that and we push our students to do that. It's part of our culture, right? So, so I think I'm proud of, I, I am, one of the things that I, that makes me different than I was when I was 22, 23, starting IFYC is I appreciate the culture of those organizations that I was dismissive of 25 years ago. That doesn't mean I want to be a part of them, but they get to have their own culture as long as it is relatively open to people from a range of identity groups. And you've got people who say, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm gay and black and I feel like I fit here. I'm Latina and female and young, and I feel like I fit here. It's not, it doesn't feel alien to any identity group. I think places get to have their own culture. And I think that a, that, um, a healthy civil society is a place with a range of institutions with particular cultures that figure out how to 
how to be in a reasonable cooperation with each other. Thanks, Ibu. And, and thank you for articulating the, really the power of, of a culture within a community, within an organization, the, the, the organizational culture that any place can have, right? So this is a shift. And, and um, as you were sharing, and as Stephanie and, and Iran have shared as well, I have a, a, a follow-up question for you, Stephanie, based on culture shifts. You work in a medical setting, and um, Naran, I know you work in a nonprofit, and Ibu, I know you own your own shop. I got your own shop, 40 people, right? So this is the lens that I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm coming at. There were six virtues, six factors that, that Professor Curie shared. They were courage, justice, humanity, temperance, transcendence and wisdom. Courage, justice, humanity, temperance, transcendence and wisdom. Thinking about your specific shops, your specific places where you where you're engaged in now. I'm assuming that you've done something to change some culture in that space. Tweak it, improve it, a little bit of this, a little less of that. Which one of those six or whichever one you want to talk that isn't those six, have you used in changing that culture? And Stephanie, for the better, I'm not, I'm not throwing shade as the kids would say on, on, on the health professions or, 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 or the medical uh, uh, system, but I imagine you've instituted a little bit of, of change in your time in your space. Can you think of which one of those six you maybe leaned on a little bit extra to institute some of that cultural shift, some of that cultural change? This is really a tough question because it's a toss up between <laughs> courage and wisdom. Um, but if I had to pick one and it sounds like you are pushing me to pick one, I'm gonna go with wisdom. And um, especially as it was operationalized and described earlier by um, Dr. Creary. Um, And now I'm torn. Now I'm like, oh, but but courage is so <laughs> important too. But I'm going to go with wisdom. No, I'm going to stick with wisdom. And I'm going to say wisdom, particularly um, the ability to model um, a term that, that we've coined recently called empowered listening, to really hear and learn from the lived and shared experiences of others, and to be able to pivot, to hear that feedback and alter course. Um, and it, we have instituted a number of new initiatives in our hospital this year. Um, we launched an anti-racism, it's an anti-racist justice and health equity um, action plan, for example, for the organization. Our organization happens to be 220 years old. Uh, so, um, and this work has never been done before in this way. Um, I'll, so I'll give you an example of where I think wisdom really helped out. Um, one of the things we decided to do early, um, like all scientist practitioners, is that we wanted to gather more data. And we decided that we wanted to launch a listening tour um, that, um, you know, it, that, you know, you can't, everything that's faced can't be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And that we felt throughout the organization, there was tremendous need for people to have a deeper understanding specifically of the lived, observed, and supervised experiences of racism within our organization. And we had to have some real sort of internal assessment and reckoning with not only our own institutions role in contributing to injustice and bias um, as an institution, but also the field in which we sit of psychiatry, which also has its own track record of bias and in injustice. And then with, and within the context of medicine, which has an atrocious track record, regard, you know, we can just go on and on, but we needed to understand our own history as, as part of that process. So we embarked on um, this listening tour and it was really designed to be um, like a um, 
almost a controlled study, very structured. We were in there to really create brave spaces for people to come forward and share the truth of their experiences over time in our organization. Uh, and we did a lot of preparation, a lot of training. We developed training for our leaders. We know from the research literature that when leaders make themselves available to really lean in and hear and listen to um, the experiences of marginalization, bias, and oppression of members of their organization, that it can really contribute to culture shift. So we knew that that was important, but that our leaders first needed to be trained so that they could hear in a non-oppressive way. Okay, the, the wisdom part came in in that we designed this process um, very systematically to ensure that we covered every single um, program and unit within our organization, right? So very comprehensive, very structured the way we were going to go about this. Um, but we began to hear back um, from people within the different parts of the organization who had the courage, frankly, to come forward in one way or another and say, you know what, I really want to participate in this listening tour, but I don't feel so safe doing it in the context of my particular program. Uh, and therefore I'm probably not going to participate. And this thing was so meticulously designed, like a research study at this point, right? We pivoted, not just as in reaction to that, but we heard a few other things. And on a dime, we scrapped the entire, not the plan for the listening tour, but the structure, the procedures, the ways that we were gonna go about it. And instead we redesigned um, sessions that were identified by affinity group. So people could choose rather than, and so no, it wasn't as structured and systematic and we didn't hit every single department within the hospital, but we heard that feedback and we modeled, I, I think this takes um, some degree of wisdom to be able to say, you know what, we got that wrong. And um, rather than go through with our well thought out plan, we are going to pivot and we're going to model and say, we're going to redesign it to and model empowering listening that we heard from those. We want to empower those who came forward to share their apprehensive apprehension about participating and redesign the approach. Um, so I'd say that's a specific example of um, so a, a sub part of wisdom, I think, is also um, being able to say, like, I think that was wrong, or to be able to apologize, make an authentic, empowered apology, um, which goes along with empowered listening. And it's a skill and a trait that uh, many managers and leaders um, could really, you know, develop in a more intensive way. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I chuckled when you said apologize. I'm known around Wake Forest for trying to get my colleagues to say, my bad, I'm sorry. It, try it on for size, it's not the end of the world. It, it means a lot. The thing that I really appreciate it, when you shared this notion of empowered listening, you can't hear the wisdom if you're not listening for it. And they really do go hand in hand. So I, I really appreciate that. By the way, you also got courage in there, which I also appreciate. <laughs> I acknowledge that as well. Miran, what about you? Great. Well, I really appreciate the framework offered, and I would I would submit one that kind of relates to all of them, which is humility. Um, and I think that we all, um, you know, we, we all make change in ways big and small wherever we are. Um, and one of the examples I'll share is that in addition to my work running the discretionary fund at Ford, I also oversee our global work in disability rights. And like five years ago, I didn't know like one thing about disability rights. And, you know, the Ford Foundation announced a new strategy focused on inequality in 2015. And it was like big fanfare, lots of press releases, lots of framework, like we're so excited, we can't wait to tell the world. And in that, we also shared a, a kind of framework about what we think drives inequality. Um, and one of those things was persistent prejudice and discrimination. And we identified all these different intersections of identity that we 
we said contributed to that race, class, gender, because we work in South Asia, caste, we didn't say anything about disability. And we started to hear from uh, disability rights activists around the world. Um, and they were, they were mad. They were super mad. And it wasn't like friendly mad, like, hey, guys, like, you should check this out. It was like, hypocrites, you guys do, you guys uh, are not going to be able to deliver on your, your baby's crying. Don't worry. It's a little toddler. She's, she's really cool, but she likes, she wants to be involved here. And she's very passionate about disability rights too. Okay. So, so people were like super mad. And I think like watching my boss, Darren Walker in action, like I, I would have been like, okay, you guys have to be so mean about this. That's not the point. Like they were totally right. And I think the humility manifested when it was just like about listening and being like, okay, like, doesn't matter how the feedback comes to you. Like you kind of don't have a right to have an opinion about it. You got to like take it in, listen and figure out what you're going to do about it. And so that led to a series of things, which I'm so excited and passionate to share. You know, we have limited time here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and we've been pretty methodical about documenting the journey along the way. Like it's always my inclination to like, wait till you get it right. And then you can talk about it. And then you can talk about what you learned. But like every year since then, we've been able to be like, okay, this is what we did right. This is what we did wrong. This is what people are mad about. This is what we're proud of. And I think all of that is kind of imbued with humility. And I think that's just like such an important, like, you got to be able to say like, I did this wrong. This is so embarrassing. Mea culpa, like, all of that stuff. And I don't think that's like my natural inclination because I think a lot of folks are like, even well-meaning folks are like, I want to get this right. I don't want to offend anyone. And it's just like, sometimes it's just like about not waiting and perfecting and, and just like doing the work and working with the right people, hiring the right people. Um, and so I can go on and on about that. But uh, Jose, I, I know you had a very discreet question. So I feel like I answered it and, uh, and uh, happy to talk more about any of that. So yes, you answered it and um, your uh, child also backed it all up. So completely handled, handled with the plump. Um, the humility uh, point is interesting and, and, and thank you for sharing that experience with the Ford Foundation where you, it's not that you didn't hit your mark, you just missed it a little bit, right? And, and people gave you this constructive feedback of, by the way, you, you could have done this a little bit different or whatever. We, we didn't hit the mark, Jose. Like we were not hitting the mark. Like so, it was, you so, know, it's, it's okay. Like if that's okay. Like as long as you can pivot and leave yourself the room to be able to claim that. That's very generous of you, but I just want to be honest. Like it's pretty glaring when like, you know, 20% of the world's population is disabled and they experience the most extreme force you know, forms of inequality, and you come out with a with a you know proposal you're really proud of, of addressing that, and you you don't you don't address the needs of a pretty significant part of the population. So that's very kind of you, but I have to I have to say like it was bad. <laughs> Good. Well, then thank you for for saying it was bad. It's interesting. A, a couple of years ago, I had the privilege of hearing Ibram Kendi speak, uh, who Ibu referenced a few minutes ago, and one of the things that he uh, that he really emphasized is this notion of intent versus impact. Well, it wasn't my intention, so I'm not sorry, right? And so, you know, we we've been trading in that in that currency of it wasn't my intention, so I get to ignore your, the impact that it's had. And what you've demonstrated for us through humility, uh, through courage, I'm still going to courage, Stephanie, because frankly, it's my favorite um, to be able to say this is this is actually something we did wrong. And by the way, Jose, we don't need an out. We we acknowledge the fact that it didn't go very well. And more importantly, this is the impact that it had. There's virtue in that. There's character in that, as much as we'd like to not get that constructive feedback. So, Lauren, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Ibu, coming back at you. Your organization, 40 People Strong, that shop. Of those six that, that, that we've shared, which one are you leaning on to create that cultural shift or change? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a version of courage, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Um... I'm going to juice that in a particular way. I'm going to, there's probably, if, you know, and when I was preparing for this, the four words that kept coming to me that if I don't share these four words, uh, I will not have done my job is this. Um, power can be generous. Power can be generous. And I think that, that there is, uh, 
it is not a bad thing to acquire and to hold power. It is a bad thing to not be generous if you have it, right? And I think a form of generosity is dealing with people's um, uh, unfriendly anger in a humble way and revising. I mean, that's, a, you know, I know Darren a little bit uh, uh, and I know Hillary a little bit and I know uh, Naran a little bit. And there's a, there's a lot of, you know, there, there's a lot of generosity there, right? The Ford Foundation has a lot of power in the social sector. And if you're powerful, you ought to be generous, right? And, and it, is, it is okay to have power, but it is not okay to have power and to not be generous. And I think that the, the reason that that matters for institutional leaders is because one of the ways that you get to being an institutional leader is you play the game really well. And we all know that the game is unfair. And the question is, when you get to a leadership level, are you going to do things that are a little bit different? Are you gonna be generous in ways that, that show courage? And so I'm gonna give a very concrete example of this, right? Um, uh, every, the, the vast majority of institutions who have the moniker excellence attached to them, whether it's a university or a foundation or whatever, they get to that by rejecting lots of people. They literally brag about the number of people that they reject. So, and I don't know, I have no brief for the person I'm about to mention, but Michael Crow goes from Columbia to Arizona State. I've never met the guy. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not I have no brief for him at all. But he goes from Columbia to Arizona State and he starts getting, you know, uh, um, advice on, uh, advice on, you know, how do you, how, how do you make a university more excellent? And everybody says, you figure out a way to drop the bottom third of your freshman class, right? And you hear, here's how you go about raising test scores and here's how you blah, 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 right? And at some point, Michael Crow like basically thinks the same thing that honestly, virtually every 14 year old must think about education that this is crazy, right? Like all my teachers talk about being kind and inclusive and like second step and being an upstander, not a bystander. And, and they keep on talking about like going to, you know, going to colleges who take pride in rejecting nine out of 10 applicants, all of them who have like had a million sleepless nights along the way. And it is just the pinnacle of obviousness. It is just obvious to say, this is nuts. Why are we hanging our reputation on the number of people we reject? It is utter craziness. And it is in deep and profound conflict with every value at the heart of any of these institutions. So at IFYC, I walk around saying, find a way to say yes. Find a way to say yes. So we don't, we don't, you know, uh, we don't give, you know, we give a lot of mini grants away at IFYC. What happens if we get an application that's not bullseye, not on par? Find a way to say yes. Don't do it in a way that lowers the excellence of the organization. We really pride ourselves on being excellent. But if, if we are going to pride ourselves on being the kind of excellence that finds a way to say yes and helps raise standards along the way. And, and the thing about it is that, again, it is like utterly obvious that saying no to lots of smart and good people is an exercise in exclusivity. And it, it takes a little bit of creativity to be in a position of power and to say, I'm not gonna do things the exact same way, at least in this regard, right? So power can be generous and find a way to say yes, that, you know, and we don't get it right all the time, but, you know, I'll, I'll say, we don't do high school internships at IFYC, but if a significant donor asks us, we find a way to do it. Okay. So if we can do it for that person, why can't we do it for other people? And by the way, we're not the only nonprofit that does that. Every place does, everybody place does, every place does favors for the people who do favors for them. But if I can do a favor for your kid, I can figure out how to do a favor for the person, the 16 year old who just, you know, 
read an essay by a staff member at IFYC and was super inspired and emails me out of nowhere and says, how can I be involved? I could figure that out too, right? I could find a way to say yes. It's an incredible uh, gauntlet you've thrown down, Ibu, right? Um, and it's got me thinking about, oh, whoa, you're on, go, no. I'm sorry, I have to unmute. That was fantastic, Ibu. Like if we were on a live panel and we didn't have to like, mute and look, you know, like look at each other, like, Absolutely, totally. And that's like just the wrong framework of operating and way too many institutions, even public institutions operate that way. It's, it's heartbreaking and it's shameful actually. So just, just plus one, all of that. Yeah, and I don't mean it as like, I don't mean it as a weird challenge, right? You know, I, I, I know I'm at Wake Forest. I know that we're at a Wake Forest. We're at an elite institution. I love Wake Forest, right? I love the Ford Foundation even though only one out of 10 of my grant requests gets, gets accepted. But I, I love that. I lo look, I'm a Rhodes Scholar. Like, I, like I've lived in the world of exclusivity, right? Like I'm, I am made by that world. But at some point you wake up and you're like, wait a second. What? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to like rest my reputation on saying no to people, you know? Or if you had like UCLA accepting like 60% of their students 30 years ago and 9% this year and like, you know, in this year, like this, like public institutions really, I mean, I don't want to distract us, but it is actually a really relevant part of the DEI conversation. Who has access to what and why? No, and Naran, I don't think you're distracting us at all. Um, you mentioned UCLA. I went to the University of Florida and I used to joke and say, I could never get in today. And there's two realities there. The mm -hmm. reality is I could not get in today. And the other reality mm -hmm. is, but had I not gone into UF, I would not be having this privilege right mm -hmm. now, this unearned privilege of being, talking with you all and engaging with this with this group of individuals. Mm -hmm. and, and when that settles in, Ibu, it's, uh, um, apologies if I reframed it incorrectly as, as a challenge or a gauntlet, because my, my, my take on it for the work that I do is, how do we increase the, the the yeses, right? And it's not it's not a zero sum game, right? Ibu, it, it's not it's not a binary. It's how do we get a little bit more yes, and 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 how do we even reframe the concept of yes? So you can hijack the conversation whenever you want. I, I just meant by God, I, I just meant like that wasn't meant to be uh, that that was meant that honestly wasn't meant to be a critique. That that was of anybody, right? That was meant to be like a like yeah. wait a second, like how is it that like we are all a part of this? Yeah. We're all a part of this. Yeah. And actually, in healthcare, mm -hmm. it healthcare has experienced the revolution totally, most yeah. remarkably in the last year because literally, like I, I live in Chicago, right? And so you have these hospitals who and and this is so you have these hospitals who brag about. Uh, um, who brag about like, you know, the famous rich people who fly in from other continents to do, yeah. to get their surgeries at their hospitals, right? And, and now as a result of activists, mm -hmm. they, you know, activists are like, you can't figure out how to take care of people down the block from you. Mm -hmm. And like, you're, 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 you're gonna like have commercials about how some billionaire from London flew in. Well, what are you like, <laughs> why, why don't you figure that out? Yeah. Thank you so much for this discussion. So I've got uh, an additional question. I love this because we're mm -hmm. burning through time like there's no tomorrow, right? And, <laughs> and so this is great. This may be the last question I get. So one of the things that all three of you have shared in your own ways is how mm -hmm. tiring this work can be regardless of our virtues mm -hmm. or regardless of what we bring in, mm -hmm. um, whether or not you're open to getting that constructive feedback, it's still constructive. Never mind the folks who don't want to attend. Stephanie, when you were talking about an institution that's 220 yeah. years old, that's a lot, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. a colleague of ours on this panel wrote a book recently. Did that just happen? Beyond Diversity, Creating Sustainable and Inclusive Organizations. Stephanie, I told you you had some fans, but this is why you need to get a chance to get it reintroduced. And incidentally, your co-author, Lauren Wadsworth, was also part of this book, right? This isn't just a shameless product plug. This is actually, I'm going somewhere with this, Stephanie. So here we okay. go. How can we sustain ourselves mm -hmm. and our organizations to get beyond diversity, to get beyond inclusion? Note, lately we were talking about getting beyond equity into justice, diversity, inclusion, mm -hmm. equity, and justice. High bar, higher bar, higher bar, higher bar. How do we sustain ourselves? Mm -hmm. And when we get people to really buy into this, how do we sustain them? 
you can mention virtues. You don't have to mention virtues. You can mm -hmm. talk about whatever, but how do we do that? Such a good question. And title of one of the yeah. chapters in the book. Um, <laughs> and it's so important uh, because as, as people often say in DEI work that this work requires both a commitment of the head and the heart. And just by definition, I don't think I have to say much more uh, to convey like what that might mean on a day-to-day -day basis. It's why the courage part is so important. I think it takes a lot of um, courage uh, to um, utilize both your head and heart to bring both aspects of yourself to your work uh, and your profession every single day. Um, but sustainability <laughs> is uh, really important. And, um, and there's so many things I'll say first that um, organizations can do. And one is um, to openly prioritize the work. And I mean like not quietly, like a full-throated verbal public commitment, um, something that like our, the president of our hospital modeled really well this year. Um, everywhere he went, whether it was to our board of Re regions, to our president's cabinet, to our town hall, you know, community meetings, which um, the entire organization was present. He made it clear in, no uncertain terms that adjusting, ad addressing racism and promoting health equity uh, and justice as our organ in, our, in our organization was the top priority from this point forward. Um, and he didn't, you know, couch the words. He was just so clear about it. Um, so that's one piece of it. We know from the research how important it is for leaders to be very clear about how they prioritize uh, this work. Um, but another companion to sustainability is an important part of that message, which is um, creating a culture, an organizational culture and structure that recognizes that this work belongs to everyone. Um, that there isn't, you know, the chief, um, chief diversity, equity, inclusion officer over there, or this DEIO office over here, or the office for equity and health equity over there. And it's their job, it's their responsibility, but to create a real sense of this is everyone's job in our organization, in our community. Every person needs to wake up every day thinking about what's my responsibility? What's my contribution to creating a more just, a more equitable um, organization today? What can I do? How am I gonna contribute to this effort? So it's like a shared leadership model, a shared responsibility. And if organizations can move even the slightest bit in that direction, it will go a long way. Um, toward sustaining those who have been in the trenches, as was mentioned earlier, doing this work for a very, very long time. Um, so openly um, prioritize, create or espouse and promote a shared responsibility uh, model. And then another thing that is um, sort of easy to say and often overlooked, properly resource the work and access, what I love was that, um, you know, Dr. Creary introduced herself as a DEI scholar. And so often we forget when it comes to this work that that scholarship, that expertise exists. And, um, and too often organizations look inward and tack the responsibility on to members of the organization who are already potentially burdened and marginalized and look to those individuals and assume because they maybe identify as having a disability or as being a BIPOC employee that they also hold some sort of expertise in this area. And then we anoint them as the experts within our organization and say, you go ahead, now it's your job to fix this. Instead of properly tapping, and that doesn't mean that they don't have the expertise, um, but you know, access the tremendous 
um, body of literature and um, just brilliance that exists and has existed for some time in this growing area. Bring the necessary expertise and pay for it. Put your money where your mouth is. If you value DEI work, then properly resource it. Those things collectively, I think, um, will go a long way towards sustainability. Stephanie, thank you for that. The, the excitement, the genuine um, excitement that you share talking about that topic um, and describing it as, as empowering others through resource allocation, promoting it, uh, you can tell that that is how you stay sustained. This work can be so debilitating from time to time that it is important to have that leadership. The one thing that I, I appreciate you giving all of us on this call is permission to promote. You know, we talk about humility. That's my own family of origin stuff. And particularly as a counselor, I'm not supposed to be a, a promoter. And yet if we don't say something about this work, if we don't espouse its value and its impact, then it's lost on those who don't value it and it deaffirms those who do. So appreciate your, your wisdom to go back to your word. Thank, Thank you so you. much. You're welcome. Ron, same question for you. How do you sustain yourself in this work and an organization that may or may not be new to this? I mean, find what makes you joyful in the work, create community. And like if the community doesn't come, arise naturally out of the work, seek it out cultivate it, um, spread, spread the work around. I mean, I think that like a lot of people take, a lot of people who are passionate about mission take a lot on themselves. Like I think, you know, um, shared responsibility and accountability is really important, but like, I just like in my own daily work, like I, I find it's, it's super important for me to feel like optimistic hopeful, positive, and to kind of make sure those around me have have that available to them, have that as part of their day to day. So, um, and then I guess just like DEI work, broadly speaking, like whatever, whatever you want to call that is not just about confronting all of your own um, shortcomings or you know, confront, you know, calling people out all the time. Like, like, I think some of the frameworks that we, or some of the strategies and best practices are, um, can feel punitive. And on the other side, there's so much joy and celebration and things to experience and ways to see the world you don't normally have access to. And you don't want like all DEI work just to be like the, the whatever party for whatever culture, like that's, that's not substantive either. But I think there's like room for a balance and to find, to make the work joyful. So I'm very, I, I'm really passionate about that. I, you know, I, Stephanie, I'm really glad you brought up the ap appropriately resource this work piece of this. That is just like so obvious. So much of this relies on unpaid labor I mean, you know, unpaid labor for people who, who should be grateful to have the opportunity because they're being helped. And it's just like more work. So um, getting appropriate expertise, paying people and compensating them for, for that expertise, um, taking that expertise like seriously, not just box checking, all of that's really, really important, but just like you have to spend money on it and you have to budget for that. Meaning you have to be proactive, not just like, approving a special ad hoc expense because you later on figured out you have to pay for this. Like, like whether it's accessibility or whatever kind of inclusion, like you have to pay up because something is wrong with the way you're operating right now. And, um, and you need to figure out like how you're going to fix it. So I just, I so appreciated that point. It's so important and urgent and it's a proactive point when you have to like budget for it in advance when you're approving your budget, like the year before, not like, special okay special expenses afterwards because that's just like it's like embarrassing it's like super embarrassing it's the way a lot of people operate because yeah. this is like a special initiative this is like a special opportunity it's like a gift on bestowing upon like employees who are asking for it like it's just like no thanks thank you neuron a couple of words stand out intentionality plan it on the way in don't just tack it on on the way out and then this notion of charity, 
So many folks are supposed to be grateful they're being labored extra to put together the DEI PowerPoint because you know we really want to value your culture. Well, if you wanted to value my culture, you wouldn't focus just on mine. You'd focus on the pluralism in our society and our organization, and you would put some resources to it, whichever that may be. So, thank you for that, uh, Stephanie. Look at what you started with your book. So, <laughs> there you go. And, and you know, I'm sure others you... wrote, yeah, others wrote it before that, but but I I, I blame you. Ibu, okay. what about you? What are you What are you thinking about how you sustain this work? Yeah, so so I'll I think there's there's two uh, issues on the table, and I'd love to uh, address both of these. And I, I wonder if we are getting to, to the end here, Jose. So I'm you know we're making so one is um uh, both what Stephanie and, and Naran were saying about about just our your about sustaining yourself. So so like I can't imagine doing anything different. And and I've been doing this you know. I started IFYC, the idea hit me when I was 22 or 23 years old, and I uh, did doctoral work along the way, but I've all, since 22 or 23, I've been building this organization. I'm 45 and I'm still building it. And, uh, and part of the reason, first of all, that's just like being lucky, right? That's just like, that's like winning the jackpot. And I, and I realized that. Um, uh, and part of it is I'm, I'm not good at a whole lot of things and I'm not being, that's not false humility, right? Like when I was, when I was a grad student at Oxford, like I, I had friends who were like, do I go to Harvard medical school or Yale law school? And I like am embarrassed about what my test scores were, right? I mean, they were good enough to get me to the university of Illinois, but not to any of the fancy schools that they went to. Right. So there, there are just, there's a lot of things I'm just not good at. Like I didn't, you know. I, I tell my kids all the time, I got a 64.7 in, in pre-calculus. I begged my teacher for a C and that was the last math, math course I ever took, right? And, and actually, there is actually a great gift to sucking at a lot of things because you kind of have to just do what you're good at. Like, like you know, if, if, you, if, if, you, if you're elite educated, you know, a lot of people who are good at a lot of things and they live under the anxiety of choices. I didn't actually have too many choices. There was, there were many places who would not have wanted me. Right. Uh, and so my passion and what I'm good at, uh, and what I, you know, and what I think is significant and what gives me joy in a day-to-day basis just happens to align. Uh, you know, and, and there's domestic, dimensions of this also as I like sit in our living room and I flip on every light switch to figure out which switch turns on the light right above me. And my wife turns to our kids and she's like, your father is not good at most things, but the things he's good at, he's very good at remembering which switch turns on, which light is not in that category. Right? Like, like there's like half of half of like stuff like that. I am not very good at, but you know, finding what you love, uh, figuring out how to do that, um, taking as a gift, the things that you're not good at, you'll never, you'll never be, you'll never have anxiety about, about, uh, wondering whether you have to walk through that door because it's closed in your face. Thank the universe for that, you know? So, um, the other thing is I have power, right? Like I, you know, and, and, and I don't have like mad social power, but I, I have power about what I do at IFYC and what I don't do. And, and part of that serves me because I get to do the things that I like to do. And part of that serves the organization because I, because I get, the organization gets me doing what, what I, what I want to do. There's a, there are, I think one of the greatest powers that anybody can have is the power to, to design their life and work to focus on the things that they care about. And I, I get to virtually do that with, with virtually every hour of my day with, you know, and it's, it is a crazy privilege and there's actually very few people in the world with that privilege, right? Uh, um, but I honestly, I have it. So, so power has to be generous. I have to be generous with it, but, but I have that. On the diversity question, um, you know, I think it is clear to me identity and diversity will always matter and ought to always matter. And I, I came up in the movement and, and I started an organization in the broader field. And I'm also struck by how the discourses have changed over time. So when I was growing up as an Ismaili Muslim, the only thing I ever heard from my parents was how lucky I was. 
Now, you know, being named Ibu Patel in the western suburbs of Chicago in the 1980s, I didn't always feel lucky at Glencrest Junior High. But the discourse from my parents were, we have the final revelation, we have God's last prophet, and we have God's, we have God's anointed guide in the Aga Khan. And, and it was actually a bit jarring for me to get to places where people assumed that I was oppressed and that I ought to look at myself as oppressed because it was in such deep conflict with, with, with the, the lessons my family had given me but also just like straightforward understanding of theology, right? I mean, virtually every Muslim believes that we have the final revelation and that we have God's last prophet. And that, and that is a great, it's a great gift and it's something to be stewarded, right? Um, so, you know, and I kind of, you know, I come up uh, at late 19, 1990s, early 2000s, um, when the word, when, when community development was in its asset-based moment. John McKnight, Jody Kretzman, and it was actually viewed um, negatively to talk about pop, to talk about people as if they couldn't do things. To use words like marginalized and oppressed. Now, I'm not suggesting that those words don't have value. I'm simply saying in a different moment, in, in a field of social change, the language was very different and the frameworks were very different. And, and you can imagine in 10 years that the language and frameworks might be different. So identity will always matter. Diversity will always matter. The language and frameworks might change, right? Uh, and, and the groupings might change. So if we take a minute to reflect on, on the term people of color, what percentage of the world could we fairly describe as people of color? Just do the quick math. Basically, everybody outside of significant populations in the United States and Canada, Europe, Russia, Australia, New Zealand, probably 80 to 85% of the world, we would fairly describe as people of color. And then you ask yourself the question, is there, are there useful generalizations to be made about 6 billion people? Hmm. Maybe a moment for reflection, right? And so I, I'm, I want to fall in love with issue areas. I do not want to fall in love with, uh, with every framework that's used in the moment. I want to consider the fr various frameworks Right? I do not want to fall in love with every frame because I've just I've been around for long enough to see the frameworks change. And and because of how I present, I am called by I'm called oppressed by enough people that I need to like encourage them to have a Socratic moment and to please allow me to define myself. Uh, and, and, you know, I think I'm the luckiest person in the world for all the reasons I've shared here. Who else gets to start their own organization? Who else gets to design their days the way that I do? Who else gets to, you know, like, think, have the theological gifts that I believe that I have? You know, my, my kids are healthy. My, my, my roof don't leak. I have food on the table. Alhamdulillah, right? Like, praise be to God. Thank you, Ibu. Um, so much to think about and process there. Self-awareness stands out. Y you know what's important. You remember your upbringing. You remember those three tenants that your folks gave you and, and that got you through Chicago. And um, that critical eye, you know, uh, this work can unfortunately, and that's my word, not anybody else's, be so in the moment right now a framework or a new ad campaign from Adidas or Nike or something along those lines. And so you have that critical eye. We all have that critical eye to be able to see through maybe some of the fog and remember what's important. And I'm not going to raise you, but I will call you 59.5 in Calc, the last math class I ever took. Thank God for statistics. 
What yeah. a gift. What a gift. You, you went when you went other directions. I, I I could have been an engineer and and something probably would not have gone well. So thank you for that, Ibu. All right. I've only got five minutes and I do have time for one last question. And this one, it may not be easy, but it's going to be a short answer. You, all three of you live in the space of equity, inclusion, and diversity and make our societies better. You may not think you do, but you do. Looking back to when you were a younger self, let's do college. Okay. You don't have to go all the way back to like third grade. What would you tell yourself now? Right. What would you do? Knowing what you know now, knowing that this work is hard, but knowing that it's important, what might you tell yourself about this work so that you, you could sit there in your first year or second year dorm room thinking, gosh, I'm going to need something to get me through the days when I become X number of years and when I'm running a medical center in heart in Boston or when I'm doing this incredible work. What do I really want to know now as an 18, 19, 20 year old to get me through to that part in life? It doesn't have to do anything with virtue, although it's all about character and virtue anyways. What would you say to yourself? Stephanie, you're up first. What would you say to a younger version of yourself? I would uh, say a version of something that Naran said earlier, which is um, find what brings you joy and, and then also celebrate those moments, especially in this work, celebrate the small victories um, and recognize that sometimes getting feedback that may feel like negative feedback can be an indication that you are actually doing something that's on the right path uh, because people have to trust enough uh, in your ability to course correct in order to provide that negative feedback. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I love it. Should I go, Jose? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, find your people. Like, find your people who you can lean on, who know you, who can tell you when, like, things are not right, or who can affirm you and celebrate you when things are right. Um, and invest in them, and they're your people as you go along in life. Um, also, don't be afraid of awkwardness. Like, I think so much gets done in that like really weird space when you're doing something wrong or you're hearing that feedback or whatever else. Like, I just like, I kind of like don't, I kind of like never really like that. Like, I don't like disharmony, but like there is a lot that can be accomplished in the space of awkwardness. And so I wish I was more comfortable with that earlier. And just like know that like the goalpost will always change. Like you're never going to be there if you're learning. And so like the kind of embracing of constant learning and like being okay with like getting it now. And then like later on, like probably having to do more work, like that's okay. So I think those three things. Thank you, Naron. Ibu. Hey, I'm going to go bang, bang, bang here. A handful of things. Um, uh, wish for uncoolness early and embrace it. Everybody gets there someday. It's a gift to get it at 13. I got it at nine. Greatest gift in the world. Embrace it early, number one. Number two, uh, people are not nesting dolls. Do not believe that you can guess everything important about a person based on, based on how they present. You cannot guess people's attitudes, their politics, their their, their aesthetics, their taste based on a social identity, don't do it. It doesn't make you smart. That would be number two. Number three, diversity is not rocket science. It's harder. And it is not just the differences you like. Expect disagreement, expect tension. Doesn't matter how, like whatever your category is, there is internal disagreement, expect it. And uh, um, uh the fourth thing is the goal is not a more ferocious revolution. It's a more beautiful order. The goal is not a more ferocious revolution. It's a more beautiful order and building things is infinitely harder than tearing them down. If this were a stage, we've had three mics for you three to drop. Unfortunately, we have no stage. Uh, we are in a virtual uh, confined space. I, I use a term a lot and I don't use a term loose and I don't use it loosely. I use the term unearned privilege. It has been an unearned privilege to be in this space with you three today. Uh, I'm grateful for our colleagues who put this together. I'm grateful for you all for saying yes. 
but it, it, is, it is beyond a gift. It is something not to squander. So uh, from the bottom of my heart and from the top of, of my brain, I am just extremely um, grateful to all three of you for spending this time, a Friday no less. Um, Kenneth, I'm going to give it back to you. But before I do, Stephanie, thank you. Naran, thank you. Ibu, thank you. Thank you. And let me echo that. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute treat. I've been just steadily jotting down notes, even though I'm going to have a recording of this available soon. This is really fantastic. Thanks to all of you for being part of this. So while I'm sad that this does end our day of, of fun for the Character and the Professions Conference, I am happy to report that this does not end the fun of the conference. So you've already received in the chat just a few minutes ago, a link for tomorrow morning's session. We'll start at 9 a.m. Eastern time with our character and medicine session, which I think is going to be a real treat. And then we have character and business. And then the last session of the day tomorrow afternoon is character and law. It's not too late to sign up for these if you haven't already. Thank you to our moderator and panelists. Thanks to all of you who have tuned in. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Good night.